A thunder of jets in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... A loop, a whirl, and a vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time... For the life of Jay Ward, who of course is credited for creating the Rocky and Bullwinkle show, as well as a string of other titles. But there's so much more to tell about Jay's story. Let's take a look. Jay Ward was born J. No period because he was to choose his name later. Trolong, French, his mother's birth name, Ward, in San Francisco on September 20th, 1920. Yeah, checks out. His parents separated soon afterward, and his father moved to New York. Ward stayed in San Francisco with his mother, a well-known singer and dancer. Jay did well in school, and though not naturally gifted, pushed himself to succeed in sports. He received an undergraduate degree from the University of California, Berkeley in 1941, then enrolled at the Harvard Graduate School of Business Administration. Jay Ward, in other words, is an official Dysography Smarty Pants. His time there was interrupted when the United States entered World War II and Ward was drafted, a common issue amongst the Dysography's subjects. He spent the duration in the Army Air Force, and when discharged, he returned to complete his studies. Phew, safe and sound. With his fresh Harvard MBA, he opened a real estate office in Berkeley, California. Unfortunately for him at the time, but fortunately for him in the long run, he had, let's say, an unfortunate accident. The day he was about to open, the, uh, a truck broke loose coming down uh, Tunnel Road and ran into his, he was out in front of his office and uh, hit him and he was, uh, broke his legs and he was really in terrible shape. Let me introduce you to Alex Anderson. He had been childhood friends with Jay. Alex was also the nephew of the famous Paul Terry of Terry Tunes, whom we'll cover in a later episode. While working with his uncle, Alex had a wonderful idea. Let's do animation for television using limited animation. He had known about limited animation from working at Terry Tunes, but the idea of using it for television came to him after watching Disney's The Reluctant Dragon, specifically the Baby Weem section. Yes, amazing was the word. And in no time at all, the whole hospital swarmed with reporters, photographers, columnists, and sob sisters. Before the day was over, Baby Weems became the talk of the town. When I came away from that and I thought, really, that, that, that was every bit as interesting as the fully animated Reluctant Dragon. And I felt at that point that, yes, this, this, is, this is going to be, a, this is going to be a, a new world for animation. Alex had a great idea for a show using a rabbit and a tiger, but switching their personalities so the rabbit was ferocious and the tiger was a gentle giant. He called this series Crusader Rabbit. When we left our little hero Crusader Rabbit last time, he had just received word that the state of Texas was planning a campaign to rid herself of every last jackrabbit within her boundaries. Well, you can imagine how that set with our boy Crusader. He was hopping mad and fit to be tied. But Alex needed help with the business end of the venture, which is where Jay Ward came in. He was feeling a little better, and I approached him with the idea of wouldn't he like to go into business with me and he could handle the business and I could handle the, the art end of it. And uh, I thought, I didn't really think he would go for it, but he came out of the water for it and he said, that's great. And uh, so we, we went into business and we formed television arts and that was the beginning of, of, of our whole career. It was a new concept for television programmers who were already buying 20-year-old theatrical cartoons cheaply from distributors. Ward and Anderson showed the pilot for Crusader Rabbit to NBC. The network was interested but nervous about dealing with two men with no experience. Ward and Anderson teamed with experienced filmmaker Jerry Fairbanks and formed Television Arts. 
There was a fellow named Jerry Fairbanks, who was the NBC film advisor. And uh, we, we approached, Jay approached him, and uh, he came up and uh, looked us over. And <clears throat> by then we had set up the studio and we were, try we were making some, uh, well, I guess you would call it uh, our, our test films to show what our competency was. And uh, he, uh, he said, yeah, I think these guys can do it. And so he, he, he closed the deal. Alex's original concept was to have many different studios work together to create a 20 to 30 minute moving comic strip show. Unfortunately, no other studio was interested. We were stuck with just five minutes. And we, as a result, we would, we, maybe if the show had been longer and it would have been something people could uh, program into, but we were just dropped in on, on other people's shows like uh, Romper Room or some other. They'd just have a sequence, uh, a five minute sequence in, in, a, in another show. So we didn't really have our own program as such. But we were in a lot of a lot of areas. I think we got into 50 or 60 areas uh, around the country where they were running. Although they were not the first ones to create limited animation, that honor goes to Chuck Jones with the Dover Boys and the UPA cartoons like Gerald McBoing Boing. They were the first to use it for television in order to cut down on time and money. One of the things that we developed was called cycles, where you just have your your character d doing a uh, uh, a walking cycle, say, you're just continually walking and walking away. And all you have to do is pan, you just use the same, the same animation, you just pan the scene behind it and keep it going, and so it gives the illusion of walking. Because of the, uh, the fact that the visual image of the, uh, um, on, uh, on television in those days was very grainy, very, uh, very hard. If, if you had had uh, Disney-type fine line animation, you probably wouldn't have been able to see what it was. Cause, so we had to use bold black lines and heavy. Uh, uh, it, it, was, uh, it, we, it was an accommodation. Television, of course, nowadays is, is wonderful, but in those days it was pretty, pretty primitive. We did have a gag file, and every, we, we would steal from Every, 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 anything you saw that you thought you could maybe use, but uh, a lot of the, a lot of the, uh, the humor was more in the storytelling. It was more verbal humor uh, than uh, slapstick because we couldn't afford slapstick. My uncle Paul had told me he says, "You don't have to lay an egg." to tell a good one from a bad one. And Jay was very good at, tell, at knowing what would work and what wouldn't work. And so he, Jay, Jay was very good at grading, grading eggs. So we'd come up with an idea and he said, well, I think it'd be better if you try something else. He didn't try to tell you what to do. He just, uh, and later, We'll get into that, but uh, it was uh, Jay was uh, uh, Jay had what he called Jay rating, and that his whole thing is is that's not Jay rated. NBC ordered 130 episodes. Ward and Anderson got to work. After a few shows were completed, NBC decided not to air the show itself, preferring to offer it in syndication to its affiliates. After the 130 episodes were delivered, NBC decided not to renew. When Television Arts tried to make its profits from the series and move on, Ward and Anderson learned that Fairbanks had been using NBC to bankroll his own productions and was now in debt to the network. NBC now owned the films, and the Television Arts Agreement meant that they were entitled to their share of Fairbanks' share, which was nothing. In 1953, Television Arts took Fairbanks and NBC to court. The case lasted over three years, and in the end, Ward and Anderson lost. 
Wow, this crowd is passionate. Alex moved on to an advertising agency famous for Skippy peanut butter. You can learn more about that in our sister series, Breakfastographies. What do you mean we're not doing breakfastographies? You're sitting on a golden grams mine. Anyway, Jay had a taste of television and wanted more. Before Crusader Rabbit, when the two were originally pitching ideas to studios, Alex had an idea for a series called Frostbite Falls, which featured a moose and a squirrel. Hmm, this seems like this could work. But what do I know? I'm just a narrator. And apparently not the narrator for breakfastographies. Roll the clip. I had worked on Mighty Mouse back at Terry Tunes. I never understood how a mouse could fly, or it did occur to me that there was a, a squirrel, that fl a flying squirrel, and I thought that would that would be closer to reality, and it might it might give me something to work with. So that was when I I created uh, the concept of of. Uh, Mighty of uh, Rocky the Flying Squirrel, and uh, he had to have a again a, a, a teammate, and uh, I thought, well, the uh, squirrels are up in the North Woods. Uh, maybe a moose would be a, a a good a good possibility. So uh, I uh, came up with Bullwinkle the moose. There was a fellow named Clarence Bullwinkle who had a used car a lot in downtown in Oakland, and we used to drive by there. And I thought Bullwinkle was such a funny name because bull is usually followed by something other than <laughs> not quite as appropriate as Winkle. So it was a joke in itself. So. Uh, I, Clarence, after Clarence Bullwinkle, I named the most Bullwinkle. However, Alex was very happy at his ad agency job and was no longer interested in continuing in television animation. So Jay took Rocky and Bullwinkle and found a new partner. This partner would end up being Bill Scott. Scott started in animation with the Army Air Force's first motion picture unit, creating training cartoons during World War II. He then worked as a writer for the innovative cartoon studio United Productions of America, UPA. Scott also performed various functions on the televised Gerald McMoinboing show. Bill Scott will also get his own episode someday. Hang in there, Bill. A pilot was prepared, with Ward and Scott gathering the voices that would make Rocky and Bullwinkle famous. Radio actor William Conrad as the ever-present narrator the legendary Paul Fries as a library of characters including Boris, veteran radio and cartoon voice actor June Foray as Rocky and numerous female characters, and Scott as Bullwinkle himself. An all-star cast, in my opinion. And then we recorded the pilot. When we recorded the pilot, we were in a, in a, in a little recording studio. Here is June Foray, one of the finest voice actresses in the world. Here is Paul Fries, who is the voice of everybody. And there is me. And uh, we are assigning parts. And I said to Jay, well, who's going to do Bullwinkle? And he said, oh, I thought you were. So with that remarkable bit of casting, I, I became the voice of Bullwinkle. And then also the voice of Dudley Do-Right of the Mounties and uh, Mr. Peabody of Peabody's Improbable History and uh, a number of others in, in the entire J. Ward canon from that point on. So I said, well, what kind of a character is, is Rocky the Flying Squirrel? He said, just a plain little boy, but he said, I want him caricatured a little bit. So I said, well, um, how about something like this? You know, uh, maybe he's a little... Um, petulant at times, but anyway, that's the way he should be. And Jay said, oh, that's marvelous. Sure is dark in here. Yeah, I can't see my hand in front of my face. You don't have your hand in front of your face. Well, I said I couldn't see it. Jay's friend had connections to General Mills, who agreed to sponsor the show. I'm telling you guys, breakfastographies. The company bought time on ABC under the condition that the show would be run in a late afternoon time slot when it could be targeted toward children. It was about this time in 1959 that Ward suffered his second catastrophic event after the truck accident that was to shape the remainder of his life. While on a cross-country plane trip, Ward suffered a panic attack and began to hyperventilate. 
Unfortunately, someone gave him oxygen, which caused permanent nerve damage. For a while, Ward's claustrophobia was complicated by agoraphobia, a fear of open spaces. He spent months in his apartment to recuperate. Meanwhile, Rocky and his friends finally made its first appearance on television and was an immediate hit. The critics loved the humor that could be enjoyed on many levels by many ages. They overlooked the poor quality of the animation. All of the credit for the show's success was given to Ward. Eventually, they moved to NBC, where they had many problems with the censors. <sighs> A sign of the times. Well, well Jay, Jay and Bill encountered many, many uh, problems with, with the... Uh, NBC, uh, they were called standards and practices. And in fact, Bill, Bill used to say to me that th they have a policy for not doing something. They never have a policy for doing anything. It's always not doing anything. I know one, one of the times um, they had Sam the Native, who was Bill Conrad. Uh, uh. <laughs> well, anyway, they, he had Bullwinkle and Rocky in a pot. He was going to make a stew out of them. And one of the network people called Jay and said, you can't have cannibalism on the show. And Jay said, a moose and a squirrel? And meanwhile, what of Rocky himself? Well, he's tied to a stake in the middle of a mesa, awaiting heaven knows what. Yeah, what are we waiting for? We wait for Big Chief. It's pretty cold out here, you know. No worries. We build fire for you. And our hero's captor set fire to a pile of branches on which he was standing. Hey, you can't do that. Who say? The network say, quote, no cannibalism on TV, unquote. We don't eat you, just roast you. Oh, well, I guess that's okay then. While at NBC, Jay and Bill decided to promote the show by asking for statehood for a leased island in the north called Musselvania is the wettest, soggiest, dreariest place on earth. You forgot useless. Useless too. Situated directly between the United States and Canada, Musselvania has the distinction of being constantly fought over by both countries. The U.S. insists it's part of Canada, and Canada insists it's part of the U.S. Well, why do we come here on our vacation? Because after two weeks in Musselvania, any place else in the world here seems like heaven. Well, the whole idea of creating a 51st state in Pennsylvania was to help promote the bowling club show. I didn't feel that uh, NBC was going to be very good at promoting his show. Because when he had a show on a Rocky show on ABC, they did not promote it at all. NBC was starting down that same path. So he decided, decided to come up with a whole campaign called Operation Loudmouth. And that was his way of getting attention for his show. And so they came up with the whole idea of a campaign for statehood for Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is up in the upper reaches of Minnesota. They actually went and leased an island to create the state and did a whole campaign. They had a, designed a van, painted the whole thing up, glued stuff to it, the whole bit, drove across country campaigning for statehood and ended up at, uh, in front of uh, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. They, they wanted to get Kennedy to... Uh, to give them access so they could talk about statehood from Musselvania, and unfortunately, they got there just as the Cuban Missile Crisis was hitting, and uh, they were asked to leave. <laughs> so nothing ever came of it, but there was a lot of cool swag, little clip-on buttons, and campaign literature. We should have Morrison and Mr. Pasha go instead. Exactly. <laughs> For the next few years, Ward continued to oversee the production of Rocky, as well as develop other projects. A new segment joined The Bullwinkle Show when it debuted in prime time on network television. Dudley Do-Right, a parody of Nelson Eddy's Canadian Mountie melodramas of the 1930s. And our script consultant's personal favorite cartoon was added. This, too, was originally conceived by Alex Anderson. I had seen uh, a... Uh a movie called Rose Marie with Nelson Eddy and Jeanette McDonald, and it was uh, give me some men, oh some star-hearted men, and and Nelson Eddy was such a wimp. It just it, it it was ludicrous, and I thought it would be wonderful to parody uh, a mounted policeman who who uh, was was. Didn't, didn't know where he was coming from. So that was the, that was my inspiration for, but uh, again, I, uh, I, had, I had created him with the thought of um, a gal, his gal would be Bess Blushmore. And, uh, but when Bill Scott and his crew went into developing it, they, 
changed it to uh, Nell and and Nell Fenwick and the inspector and it it, it was uh, it, it was fun. I've always loved the Dudley because Jay said I I was modeled after him. Well, he was modeled after me. But if you look at Dudley, he looked like a great Mountie should look. He was a perfect looking Mountie, but he was a complete moron. I mean, the guy, you know, was, was the village idiot. Th that's the interesting thing about Dudley Do-Right is that, is that uh, the Bullwinkle show is shown throughout the world. They made all kinds of foreign deals. The one place that they weren't able to sell it was in Canada because uh, whomever deals with the Canadian uh, broadcasting, people who buy for them, felt that the, the, the uh, caricature of a Mountie uh, would be uh, harmful to the to the image of the Mounties, and therefore they never were allowed to show it. Dudley walked to town to bring Snidely in. Snidely, whiplash, I arrest you in the name of... There, what did I tell you? Dudley do ride is scared the death of me. Also, it's a great ride at Islands of Adventure in Orlando. The cartoon series Hoppity Hooper and Fractured Flickers, where silent films were dubbed with humorous new dialogue and sound effects, both made it to television for short runs. Ward kept trying to develop live-action series for the networks, but only one of these, Nuthouse, made it to the pilot stage. In 1967, ABC bought an entirely new show from Jay Ward Productions, George of the Jungle, a series Jay and his crew would be most proud of. Heavens, Carruthers, what's that? Appears to be an ape of some sort. Oh, it doesn't seem smart enough for an ape. It's George of the Jungle. What is it, George? Steel track, Commissioner! Steel track! Yes, George. Steel track is what makes it ride so smooth. <laughs> what happened? George, say already. Somebody steel track. It was true. This was another anthology series, this time featuring the titled Tarzan Spoof, the witty superhero parody Super Chicken, and the lackluster car racing series Tom Slick. Although designed for a juvenile audience, it still featured tight, witty writing, strong voice performances from Ward's regular crew, and the addition of some of the highest quality limited animation to ever appear on television. And folks, these still hold up. You gotta go watch them if you haven't in a while. They're almost as entertaining as this show you're watching right now. Almost. Wait until you're done watching this to go watch that. And like and subscribe and hit the bell. After George of the Jungle, Ward, with his dwindling crew, tried to create some more shows, but nothing seemed to inspire them. He was enjoying semi-retirement and running the Dudley Do-Right Emporium next door to the studios, selling merchandise bearing his characters. The studio closed in 1984, and whatever thoughts of returning to the cartoon business Ward might have had ended with the deaths of Bill Scott in 1985 and Paul Fries in 1986. Ward's own health began to fail in 1987. He had cancer of the kidney. He died at home in Los Angeles on October 12, 1989. Rocky and Bullwinkle, Dudley Do-Right, George of the Jungle. As we've learned, Jay Ward was not the only push behind these classic television shows, but he was a driving force in making them not only happen, but entertaining and witty as well. His life and legacy live on in the hearts of so many, and also in the soggy white clothes of others. I mean, have you ridden Dudley do right rips off falls at Islands of Adventure? You get soaked! Thank you to these people for supporting us on Patreon and Coffee. Thank you for watching this episode of Dizographies. Comment below with characters you would like to see us cover. Further reading and references are linked below. We hope to see you in another Dizography.